from J.A. to U.K. to L.A. and everywhere else. Now this is a podcast strictly influenced by Jamaican music brought to you by every caller and Junior Francis. Well, if you're driving in your car or you're sitting home alone, the Junior entertain you on his microphone. The history of huh. L.A. Sky. Yeah, hear stories from a guest while we all have a blast. From L.A. to Jamaica, it's in the podcast. Welcome to the History of LASK one-on-one sessions. I am your host, Junior Francis, alongside our producer and my good friend, Eric Kola. This series celebrates the Skia Rock Study and Vintage Reggae scene in Southern California and beyond through insightful conversations with legends and modern day talent, including those behind the scene. So whether you listen to this podcast series or watch us on YouTube, I want to say a big thank you. And please remember to subscribe and tell a friend. On this episode, we welcome musician turned award winning UK author Daniel Rachel, the amazing Mr. Daniel. <laughs> welcome, Daniel. How is everything, sir? Welcome. Uh, yeah, very good. Thank you, Junior. I've just come back from uh, from the United States. As you know, I met you on the first night in LA and I met you on the last night in, in Virginia. And in between oh, was wow. three and a half weeks of madness. Yeah. And I just, saw, I just saw all the Republicans eating pets. <laughs> First hand account, right? The, 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 yeah, you left at the right time before they ate you. <laughs> exactly. Because when there are no more pets, chances are they would start at you. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, Daniel, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I had a sell me at a, at a stand <laughs> on the corner. <laughs> on um, the high- <laughs> uh, Junior, thank you for that intro. Daniel, great to see you again. Uh, I had major FOMO for missing out on Supernova, which we're going to talk about. Um, but um, we want to talk about your 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 latest book. We're going to touch on uh, 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 at least one of your prior books. We're going to talk about the tour. We're going to talk about Two Tone and some other fun things. But um, I want to start by uh, so here's what a couple dignitaries have said about about your book, uh, Too Much Too Young, of which uh, we have a visual, Daniel. I have this oh. this one, which is the which is the U.S. American version, and then I have this one. So you can believe me that I had one prior to uh, stereo to, too much too young. Although I think most two tone records were almost cut in mono. Right. Okay. Not yeah. not totally, but the idea was to bring in the thing to I think to give it that kind of sixties feel. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> well, so, so so here's what two uh, two dignitaries have said about your book: Pauline Black from the Selector who who uh, you all saw at Supernova. And Daniel, I know that you were on a panel with her as well. She says about the book, comprehensive, cautionary, but nonetheless celebratory saga of the two-tone label. Wow. Uh, so she also said I was an honorary girl. <laughs> <laughs> she did. <laughs> Amazing. Suggs of Madness uh, calls it the definitive account of one of Britain's finest youth move- movements. So obviously those are great accolades and there's, and there's a number of other amazing accolades in the book there. So um, definitely encourage all the fans to get out there and pick up the book um, where you can. Junior. Yes, sir. It, it, it was a uh, great spending time with you uh, and Eric last month at the book soup in West Hollywood, along with legendary Lynn Val Golding of the yes. special <laughs> and fun boy three. Uh, what what's your memory from that experience? <laughs> and Sarah Jane Owens, right? Yeah, from- right, right, right. Okay, I leave right. uh, the amazing Sarah Jane, a body snatcher, and um, what was the other group she was? Bell, bell star. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Well, she is a bell star. She looked fantastic. Yeah. She and, uh, yes, she spoke indeed. Fantastically, and uh, she was engaging and really brilliant to hear. And and I was thrilled she took part in the conversation. And then the funniest thing, I think, uh, was uh, you, Junior, asking a question at the beginning, <laughs> and Linville answered, and that was the hour up. I said, Linville, give let Sarah Jane answer the next one. He said, no, no, I've got too much to say. <laughs> <laughs> he stood up and said more. 
So great. Well, that was, as you mentioned, uh, but, then, but, that was uh, yeah, I'm glad you did that because if I did that, maybe I would have been offended <laughs> if you said no. <laughs> But it was a great event. It was really good the bookshop put it on. It was really uh, brilliant to be on the strip in um, in LA. And, and it, you know, just to hear the stories firsthand from a special and a body snatcher, yeah. it was just really exciting, you know. Really, and they hadn't been together properly since the two-tone seaside tour of the summer of 1980 when the specials wow. toured with the body snatchers and the Go-Go's. And so that was really taking them back. It was great. And they both looked fantastic. That's incredible. Memory of them. Wow. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. And that right. was the, so that book soup event was the start of your, of your book tour throughout the U.S. And then talk, talk about some cities before we talk about Supernova. Talk about some of the other cities and any of the highlights throughout, throughout your U.S. tour. Oh, there are so many highlights. So many brilliant people like uh, in a, uh, it's really hard to remember some of the cities, of course, but a, of course, it's a yeah. photographer called Anastasia. I can't remember Anastasia's first name. And she's um, in, in Cleveland and she's photographed uh, women uh, and many other people. She did a book called Women in Rock since the mid 70s through all of the 80s. And she was a fascinating woman to talk to, oh, really engaging. Sure. And um, there's a brilliant picture of Patty Smith in the studio, just looking, just, she told me that uh, Anastasia had driven round all of Cleveland with Patty Smith in the car and she'd shared stories. And then she was listening to a playback of a record and uh, Anastasia clicked her. So that was a, that was a great one. Yeah. City Lights in San Francisco. Of course, yeah. And we had a couple of Rude Boy uh, DJs uh, in a club called Making Out. Right. And they had so many great cuts. Honestly, they've been over to Jamaica and scoured through all the, yeah. the second-hand dustbins and brought back all yeah. these big cuts. And then, you know, in Supernova with um, Pauline was really exciting. Uh, there were loads of great events. Um, <clears> just <throat> all of them were, really. I mean, anywhere, anywhere that somebody turns up at a bookshop and wants to discuss music and literature, I mean, what more can you want, you know? Of course, of course. Right. You know, in retrospect, uh, to compete with the other cities, I thought we could have we could have had a after party. Mm. Yeah. Should have. Next yeah. time. Yeah. Next time. Next yes, time. I think we should. Have. Oh, I mean, we kind of did, but you left, Junior. We all went to that restaurant. Oh, no, we? that's right. We were, yeah, no, we were there. Junior and I were there. For no, we weren't. You know, the except there was no music. Junior, you were sitting opposite me. What am I talking about? And then you, right? Yeah, and then your mate, uh, what's his name, um, Roman. Roman yeah. did the nights by buying shots, didn't he? Yeah. It was <laughs> so we did have an after party. And he was yeah, but what I'm talking about after party with uh, real music where real, real music. boy and good girls do actually Roman, Roman said, you know, da you know, Daniel, inside I'm really calm. I mean, no, mm -hmm. outside I'm really calm. Inside I'm going, because he's <laughs> Sarah Jane from the Bell Stars. He was like, I remember that. yeah, that was great. <laughs> Yeah, that was a good night. It really was. Mm. Um, right. And the, the turnout in LA was comparable to other places, right? What was, well, sorry? The turnout in LA was comparable to other places. Yeah, another time, other events. I mean, in upstate New York, they filled the theater. Wow. Which, yeah. And that showed footage, uh, Tony Fletcher of Jamming Magazine and Memoirs and Boy About Town. And <clears throat> he intercut the conversation with footage of all the bands, like two or three minutes of footage, and the theatre the theater was filled. So it's like the events in the UK, because he in the UK we've been having really massive events, you know, on the on the the Queen Elizabeth Hall yeah. on the South Bank in London, which I dubbed the Queen Elizabeth Terry Hall, which we have <laughs> Better from Madness and Pauline Black. And um and that was like that was you know 300 people and the British sure. Library have had an event with Road wow. and so yeah. The, the, the UK, the US events were smaller, but that probably probably reflects uh, two tone is a more marginalized uh, love affair in the US than here in the UK, where it was mainstream. Right. Well, and also, <laughs> also as we talked about, I think when we were together in LA, getting people from, you know, the west side to the east side, east side to west side, from Orange County to LA on a you know on a Friday with travel, it's just it takes a lot, which is unfortunate. Eric, I was on the bus on commitment. Yeah, and that was my concern that people wouldn't show up in 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 Hollywood, you know, because of the yeah. traffic. 
but they did. Yeah, true. No, I took the bus, yeah. and I think that took me about an hour and a half. Yeah. You're kidding me. Tough. Oh, tough, wow. tough. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so let's so, talk about Supernova. No, let's just focus on Roman and, uh, back in 10 minutes. About, <laughs> ah, <laughs> that's welcome to LA traffic. And uh, let's talk about Supernova and what an incredible event and overall experience it was, uh, the Supernova International Ska Festival, where we met up this past week. Can you share some highlights from the Supernova and your book signing? Yeah, I mean, it, that was hilarious because it could have been Chicago, the Windy City, because right. we walked on site <laughs> and the wind just knocked us over. It was like all over the place coming off the, uh, off the uh, Atlantic. But um, uh, so we were in this kind of marquee and uh, they'd set up some chairs and a table and Pauline uh, arrived, sat down and went, no way, because of the wind blown air hat <laughs> and boat. And so she rearranged it all and got everybody to sit in the round and then, <laughs> and then got the three biggest blokes and put them on, stood them up and said, you're the windbreak. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and there was there was a, this big crowd and then we started at four o'clock and at half past four junior you made a, an announcement on the on the wind rush stage and then suddenly there was another rush and the, the event grew and, and just kept on growing growing with people watching and then pauline straight away first question from Heather Augustine and first question, Pauline just went right in with making sure there were no Trump voters, that everybody was for Kamala and, <laughs> uh, and, and racism that it still exists and it's gotta be sorted and make your choice and make sure you're on the yeah. right side. And it was a really didactic, hard, political, social answer. And she just set out a store and it just was like, wow. And it concentrated the crowd and got yeah. every fixed on what this was going to be about and then we just had a great chat you know and then yeah. uh, and then she called and then because she said something about it's always men that are writing everything about music and i and i said oh sorry and she, <laughs> no no you are all right you're an honorary girl <laughs> well and 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 there's no better i mean heather Heather must have done an amazing job. I mean, talk about an, uh, an accomplished author who really knows and loves and is passionate about her music, right? I mean, just just truly. So I can imagine how cool that must have been. Yeah, no, it's, it was just but, great. And then, yeah, sorry, go on. But, uh, yeah, Pauline really and truly uh, earned my respect in every sense of the word. When she when she was on stage, she, she was very vocal. She's yeah. not afraid to take a stand against injustice, racism. Exactly. Wherever they wear the ugly head, and she, she, so we need to love and protect her, and Indeed. make sure. And when yeah, she arrived, she met, she met Jackie from the Pioneers. Yes, I love it on video. Yeah, she was really excited because the first uh, Jamaican record <laughs> that Pauline ever heard as a schoolgirl was "Long Shot Kick the Bucket," and she'd never oh. met the Pioneers, so she was just like, "Wow." Yeah. Just that's, that, that's a special moment. I've yes. never met them before. No. no, no that was and you a, introduced wow. me, Junior. That was really lovely of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, it's, it's a, all these years. And, and the pioneers, they tour England extensively. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, Junior, I, I started before, telling, yeah. I told the audience a little bit about you. I've just remembered because I was asked about, uh, why you got black and white musicians coming together and before in the afternoon we were chatting weren't we and you were telling me your story about coming from manchester jamaica and one family met your mum in manchester england and your dad in america and not seeing them for 10 years and then 10 years until your mid-20s and that your story is so much so typical of many of the two-tone musicians mm -hmm. who have traveled to another country trying to find identity in stranger wow. countries not seeing their parents so i introduced it with your story junior and then took it on to the two -tone. and it was a lovely connection because you were like the compare of that of that festival and it just brought it all together i yeah, felt that's fascinating right right wonderful wow. Well, well, I, I I definitely wish I was there. I had major FOMO. I know I was fortunate enough to uh, find my identity in Jamaica uh, during the uh, Black Power movement, the Rasta movement. So when I came to America, I couldn't be brainwashed. I mm -hmm. was uh, uh, fortunate in that sense to grow up in Jamaica during that time when reggae was moving more towards roots and consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Junior, you're many things. You're not brainwashed. However, you might be brainwashed in your love for Jamaican music. I'm not quite sure. Maybe outside of that. I, 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 I second that. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the man had a radio, so he knew all the music before anybody else. It's true. Yes, it's true. Yes. That's so, yes. so Daniel, um, let's talk about, right? So, so without Jerry Dammers, yeah, there would really be no two tone. Uh, he was he was such a true visionary. So so um, not given away because obviously people can can read about this in your book or even online. But but in in your opinion, what led Jerry to start Two Tone? And from your research and conversations, um, he wanted to launch the specials with strength in numbers. Mm. So rather than just be a the one band that was trying to become pop stars he felt that if there were other like-minded bands then it would serve better and i think that that has a a generous spirit and a socialist value connected to it right. and two-tone became the way it was initially just a description of the iridescent suits that mods used to wear in the 60s two-tone <laughs> And the logo, and, and then the, the black and white strip was nothing to do with black or white people. It was to do with the tape on a bicycle. Um, and so there was a, and then it kind of naturally merged with how fans read it and what the lyricism of the specials was. Um, but really, Two Tone was about finding those other bands. And he kind of had a sense that Madness might be the other band. He, the, the specials initiated the formation of the selector right. and jerry although he didn't had seen the beat early on and had made friends with Rankin roger earlier than that mm -hmm. um although there's some contention in the book who brought the beat to two-tone neil davis claims it was the selector but jerry from what i can gather knew about the beat before neil davis did mm -hmm. yeah fascinating right in interesting um Maybe we should talk a bit about um, racism, the National Front, and the role that Rock Against Racism movement played in the two-tone movement. Yeah, yeah. That's so fascinating. Well, I mean, the, the direct connection there is that Jerry went to Rock Against Racism gigs, was inspired, and wanted to do something that took that that further. Um, what, why it would take it further was because Rock Against Racism, their statement was to have a reggae band, invariably black musicians, and a punk band, invariably white musicians, play on the same bill and then say to all the musicians at the end of the night, will you do a jam, which is the musicians come together and jam, and make up, make up music. And that was the political statement on stage of Rock Against Racism. Um, Jerry saw Rock Against Racism knew about it and said, Rock, rather than having two different bands, let's right. make one band and that will be a multicultural band. And then he went round Coventry and picked black musicians and white musicians to be in one band. And today, <clears throat> that doesn't sound like anything extraordinary or unduly special. But in 1977, 1978, that was a dramatic political statement, even though there are other examples of, you know, in Ian Jory had a black drummer, there was Slam Family Stone, there was uh, the Equals, Eddie Grant's band. There were examples of mixes of black and white, but this was a political statement. And and then to find like-minded musicians doing the same thing. Yeah. And then the very right. last... Jerry was just, really and truly a visionary. I think so. In every so. sense of the word. Yeah, absolutely, because he envisaged how the special should be. Uh, he envisaged the artwork for the specials. He envisaged how Two Tone Records would run independently from the mainstream. Right. And he kind of cast his visionary eye over the whole of Two Tone as from it being uh, have the the grand foundation of Scar. He, he moved it potentially through Northern Soul, but into that kind of more. Uh, in Muzak influence and of, of 1980 and more specials. He then moved it onto into the studio with bringing back uh, elements of Booker T and the MGs into yeah. the influence. 
and then he so, and then he tried again to advance it, preempting really the absolute beginners craze that happened in Britain. You know, the Colin McGuinness book that, and the film with David Bowie, and he put a soundtrack on that. And really, the the, the lesser known signings in the latter years of Two Tone, the Apollinaires and the Higsons, and maybe the Friday Club, more tap into that kind of jazz sensibility that that became a thing in mid eighties Britain. So Jerry had that vision, right of lots of different stages. He didn't always carry the other members of the bands or his own band in that vision, but he had enough about him musically as an arranger and as a songwriter to drive it forward. And when you've got somebody like that, you yeah. don't dismiss it in the same way you didn't. You, if, if you dismiss Paul McCartney at any stage of his musical career with ideas, you're a fool. True, true, true. Well, right. so, and then the other important element, which we want to talk about, and I know we, we touched on and we'll continue to give praise to to uh to pauline black and we talked about sarah jane who who is at the book group uh la even of yours but so so the role that women have played and continue to play right in 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 the two-tone movement and their lasting importance um uh in your opinion and from your conversations with 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 some of the the, the female musicians but also some of the other jerry or some of the other um musicians to talk t touch on that if you will yeah, I mean, I've a, I have a responsibility as a male white author to bring in uh, yeah. women into rock literature, into music literature, and to elevate their voices where their positions were elevated at the time, but have been decreased in uh, in history. And so I rooted out those important people and gave them a, a voice. And that starts with Pauline Black, because... As far as I'm concerned, she's the first rude girl. <laughs> Jamaica had rude boys. I'm not aware they had rude girls. Right. And in two-tone Britain, then she, the way she dressed, was the first rude girl. The second rude girl is the is is the beat girl. Right, and right, right. <laughs> I <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> and then uh, in between that is is um, the seven members of the Body Snatchers who yeah. were all women, and um, and the great overriding. Uh, presence is Juliette Devee, who uh, co-managed the two-tone office from London. Um, and then on the first day of the great two-tone tour in 1979, when the special selector and Madness went on tour, the selector invited Juliet to become the se uh, selector's manager. And she is an articulate, um, yeah. intelligent woman, 21 at the time, peroxide blood and she played an integral part in two turn but to my knowledge has never been nobody's ever asked to include her in the story before and so i was really thrilled to i've really got to know julia over many years nice and she now manages billy bragg and she's a she's a force um to be reckoned with within the music industry yeah yeah no i would agree i think up until recently there's not you know you and 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 Pauline, and and I think uh, she's she might be mentioned in Heather's books, but yeah, not much has been. Yeah, well, I introduced. I I asked Julia if she'd be in Heather's book. Oh, nice, I, nice. As likewise, I introduced Heather to Rhoda and, right. and possibly Pauline. Yeah, yeah. No, that's amazing. And listen, Pauline, obviously with the selector keeps keeps waving the flag, and and obviously Rhoda's uh, really active as well. So. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I love no, that. Um, what was brilliant, you know, Eric, was at the uh, at the debate in in um, Supernova. Heather asked um, Pauline what it was to what it was to be a woman singer, front and selector, and Pauline said, "I'm a singer," and took out the woman. You know, yeah, I right. happen to be a woman, she said, but I'm a singer, and that's the right thing. We don't yeah, go. No, you're right. You're you're right. Right. Go male singer. And I'm very conscious of that. As far as I'm concerned, Paulie's just a great rock singer. No, you're you're 100 wow. percent right, and 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 I, I agree with you that it is important. Um, uh, words words matter for sure. Yes. Yeah, they do when you're when you yeah absolutely yeah. yeah yeah no that's a great point. Um. So so Elvis Costello, uh, mm. there are his song watching the watching the detectives is arguably you know a gateway and might be a first reggae type song that some people have heard, right? Who, who, who didn't grow up or didn't, were not familiar with reggae or ska. Um, so, so he could definitely be considered a gateway and there are others that we'll touch on, but, but talk about the role and the importance of Elvis Costello. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the amazing thing about watching The Detectives is that it's not the attractions uh, as the backing yeah. band. It, it really sounds like them, and later it will be on all live recordings. Okay. Um, and I don't know if I knew that. Wow. And watching The Detectives was an influence not only for Neil Davis, but for Mike Barson in Madness. Uh, when when Mike wrote My Girl and when Neil wrote, oh, flipping out, which was Neil's. I'll come back to that. Okay. So Elvis was having this influence already, as you rightly say, kind of bringing him reggae into what he was doing, like the police, yes. like the membranes, like the clash. Yes. Um, but then Elvis went up and down the UK in summer of 1979 and saw the specials on many occasions um in Leeds he trod on Pauline Black's foot <laughs> and that was their introduction and then he basically said to Jerry you're going to get in some producer and he'll ruin it get me because I'm not a producer and mm. I won't ruin it <laughs> and so they they agreed and he said he Elvis basically said I will un I will non-produce unproduce your record. In fact, that's not that's disingenuous to what Elvis did sure. because he massively produced that first record. It sounds nothing like the bootlegs of the specials you can listen to throughout '79. In fact, it doesn't really sound like, sound like gangsters. And what sure. and, and it sounds way better for it. He take he takes out. He, he plays with dynamics and levels, you know, that if you think of just an illustration, message to you, we'll do that really yeah. loud snare at the beginning, yes, outrageously yes, yes. loud, like a Rolling Stones record. Right. And then at various points, you hear Neville do a kind of a, deliver a couple of words and they come out here. And then the idea on the snare drum of nightclub, where he found a piece of sheet metal outside on the Fulham Palace Road, and he put it on a doorstep and he told John Bradbury, the drummer, to hit that, and he overlaid that over the snare drum. Mm. So on nightclub, you get... <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, real... Wow. And then, you know, and on nightclub <clears throat> backing vocals, he said he put, he put all the members of the specials in a very small contained room, um, and then he shoved loads of alcohol in there, shut the door. And then and then just as I was about to do the backing vocals, he opened it and shoved Chrissy Hind him from the pretenders, closed the door and, and recorded what happened. Amazing. <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah. 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 And then Elvis Costello released the song on two tone. Uh, well, pressed it. I can't stand up for falling down. Yes. Um, right. And then it wasn't issued, but it was pressed. Okay, and then obviously he played a big role in junior. You say it wasn't issued but pressed. What do you mean? If it's pressed, well, that means it's. It was pressed up, ready to be released because Elvis had a problem with his own record label. So Jerry said, "Come oh, and do it. On do it on two turn." And then the problem got resolved, and I think uh, Jake Riviera probably got a bit carried away and did a second pressing, and then they just but they gave them all out at gigs, and then when the special, AKA recorded Nelson Mandela. To That's make what sure I was going to touch on, right, yeah. Yeah, when they, to, Jerry was concerned about getting the record done in a small amount of time and you reuniting people like Limval, who had walked out on the specials and bringing in Dave and Roger from General Public and bringing in various different musicians. I think Rhoda, I think Rhoda was part of that too. Yeah, of course, because she's a, at that point she's part right. of a, a special AKA. Yeah. And so uh, Elvis produced it. But more importantly, when the when um, the, um, the as we now know as a sex offender, Stan Campbell refused to perform the song live on the tube. Elvis Costello um, came in and did the vocals. And if you've never, if listeners have never seen the footage of Nelson Mandela, especially AKA live on the tube, you have to watch it just okay. to see Elvis Costello. He stand. Have you seen it? He's standing next no. to Eric. He stands no, next. No. To Eric. Dave Wakelin and Rankin Roger. Okay. Those two had just done their debut performance with General Public. They performed three songs and then they came in on backing vocals. And uh, Elvis is just giving it and his voice. He should have done the lead vocals on the original. Brilliant. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm putting that on the list. Yeah. Check out. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's the UK's uh, well, um, Lee Perry. <laughs> when it comes to production. Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's a high energy. 
Yeah, not in the same I'm not sure about that. <laughs> not in the same I once called, called Dennis Bavel, the, uh, yes, the true, George true Martin. Dennis. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, or, or, or George Martin is the white Dennis Bavel. I'm not sure which way around there it is. Go. There we go. <laughs> not, not familiar with him. Uh huh. Right, but big respect to um Dennis. Oh, Dennis <laughs> Bavel is great. These Matumbi, great records. Yeah. All this stuff with uh, you know, and Linton. LK Linton, Linton. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh my yes. God, those oh, records! Wow. <laughs> genius. genius. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, the music world lost several heroes and important and iconic figures in the two tone over the past years. Can you please share a word or two uh, that best describe each? Maybe we can talk with Gap Hendrickson from the Select. Huh? I'll just name them and then you fill in. Rankin, Roger, up the beat. Well, the beat lost two members, right? You, Everett Martin, Saxon. the beat. Great. Right, uh huh. Yes, Sax that's Sax three, actually, uh, Rico, where well, Rico was uh, elder statesman. Well, we know he would have. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, Brad Berry at the specials and the special last two, uh, Terry Hall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that's, that's probably not. Did I leave out any name that ought to be mentioned? Well, I mean, there's lo I mean, there's the uh, the Beats producer Bob Sargent died recently. The um the specials engineer Dave Jordan. Uh, right. I mean, there's so many people within the two tone family. Yeah, some of, some uh, of the bad man yeah. originals, right? Yeah, but 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 but, but touch I mean, on those, if you would, Daniel. I mean, one of the great when you mentioned gaps, I mean, one of the great things about two tone is that they had two lead singers, which really right. hadn't happened, I don't think, since John and Paul. Ooh. You know, it's like a Beatles thing, right? And so you think of ah. gaps and gaps and Pauline specials, Terry right. and Neville beats. Roger and Dave, and it, yeah, it also forced yeah. it forced the camera on television programs or in interviews to bring black and white together. Whereas you know they didn't. There was a there was definitely racism in the BBC, and you don't necessarily want a black face. Well, two tone forced that by having mm. and then just the wow. sight of that. Kids like me just grew up thinking, oh, that's what you do. You have a black singer and a white singer look. <laughs> You know, but uh, so that was a really brilliant thing and an important thing. And it also was a visual thing live because you didn't know which one to be looking at. And you, they were both running around anyway. And so, so that's that's very, very important. Yes. Man, that's really a brilliant observation though you brought there. Yeah. And Rico, the cameras. I didn't think. Yeah. yeah. Right. Brilliant. And Rico, brilliant. And, Rico brilliant. and Sax are both original Jamaicans and yep. they played on important records in the 60s. And so when there was that sense of what is two-tone doing and why is it leaning on a jamaican or a caribbean past you then have sax and you have um rico but you also have neville and limbal and you know and across the selector musicians from the caribbean islands and essentially what you're doing is you're bringing the british empire together because those were those were british citizens sure. who would come over to the what they would call the motherland at different points in their life, like, uh, you know, and, and so that was really important because it was on one hand, you know, in British schools, we learned that the empire is all great. And and yet and we just and all we did was just go and dominate everybody else's countries and culture. And then but we don't teach that side of it. We yeah. just talk about the domination. We don't take any acceptance of our role in slavery whatsoever. And then and then when we welcome uh british citizens back to the uk we, they just get barraged by neo-nazis and fascists and racists and uh, it's like we you know you're just beating your own yeah so the so two-term was really addressing that social and political issue that was breaking out in violence across the streets of britain in the 70s and early 80s and here was a movement in music in exuberant music that was addressing a, a young youth to say you don't have to go that way politically you can come this way sure. and we'll give you great music and great clothes and best of all great records yeah D D daniel do you get a sense so with rico and saxa being being um uh established uh jamaican musicians do you get a sense that that they were approached by other uk-based um bands startups to join and they just didn't want to like like i'm wondering why and obviously 
the stars aligned and it all happened and it was amazing. But like, I wonder why was it the beat for sax and why was it the specials for Rico that, that, that made that connection? Well, Rico was playing in London um, in the, from about what he always was in the seventies, but you can right. see 77, he was playing at places like the hundred club, which had been a big punk venue. Okay. He played on a membranes uh, record. Uh, he played on a Tumbi's record. Yep. And some of those recordings, he played with Dick Cathell, um, who would become the ninth member of the specials. And Dick okay. would also engineer a lot and produce some of the special, special AK records. And so they were a kind of a pairing. And I think Dick actually produced Rico. So when, so Jerry was aware that Rico was in London okay. and, and sent Linval to find him because Jerry was too scared. <laughs> and uh, Linval got the message to, to Rico. And I think it was only because when Rico came to put down his chops on message to Rudy, Jerry invited him to join the band. Whereas I don't know if the other artists had actually given Rico got it. I see. an invitation. I think it's probably as simple as that. And then in, in terms of Saxa, Saxa, I don't, I, I'd somehow gone under the radar. Um, and he was simply just playing in, in, a, in pubs in Birmingham. No more mm -hmm. than that. And Beats drummer Morton Everett knew Saxa. And, and because uh, Dave, a, Andy and David from the Beat had mm -hmm. taken Everett to punk gigs, to see what they were into. Everyone was, no, 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 if I've had to come and see punk, you come and see my music. So he he took the white kids to this black, um, uh, where black people went to see their music in um, in Hansworth. Okay. And, they, and they first heard Saxa two weeks before they were due to record Tears of a Clown. And they were just mesmerized and said, you've got uh, to do our recording. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Junior and I had the pleasure uh, on a uh, few occasions to working with Rico Rodriguez. Uh, this is one one show that we did at the El Rey Theater in L.A. back in really two thousand five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We wow. um, uh, he played L.A. three different times, so then he played a festival up um, up Northern California, and we did a road trip down here, and he had great stories. And then I had one of my trips over to London. Um, I, I had I went to a pub with Rico. <laughs> it was great. Such a, Which such a pub? Pub. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I don't, yeah, don't remember. I yeah, think we're both fortunate to spend time with him. I, yeah, I think yeah. I spent a week. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. 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 In yeah. in the nineteen nineties, um, my friend's band, Ocean Color Scene. Mm -hmm. Who you might Steve Craddock now plays guitar with with Paul Weller. Okay. Uh, has them for thirty years, but they but Ocean Color Scene invited Rico to join their band. Oh, so he okay. he he. If if you listen to a song called um, shirt. Oh God, what's it called? Ah, uh, oh, Shirley was a lady. Mm. Uh, Shangri La is it called? Um. Anyway, Rico does a three minute solo on the end, like Ghost Town. Oh, I'll have this to is check about that. Nineteen ninety six. Okay. Huckleberry Grove, he plays, <clears throat> and I'm sure Steve said to him, let's do what we did on Ghost Town. And right, 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 right. <laughs> and it's, a, oh, it's an unbelievable solo. So because, um, I, I was touring with um, Ocean Color Scene in my band, yeah. and so I got to know Rico in the mid-90s. And I said, and this is going to sound a bit odd, but I said to Rico, I, as a kid, learned to play the trumpet because of your solo on Ghost Town. And I know he plays trombone, but I was playing, I had a trumpet. Sure, and, sure. And, and I couldn't really understand Rico very well because his, his accent was really Strong, thick. Sure. Yeah, yeah, he insisted on not speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what I think he said to me was, listen to Ghost Town, the 12 inch, at 33 and a third RPM. <laughs> and I thought, what, what are you talking about? And he was insisting, no, no, no. And then you'll understand what my feeling is towards the song, because I'm trying to tell you Jerry's lyrics in my trombone. So I went home. And did that. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, I said, and I was living with the lead singer of Ocean Color Scene. And, uh, and I said, listen, we have to listen to Ghost Town at, at slower speed. <laughs> Rico said. And, uh, and I did. And at first it was ridiculous. And then it got to the trumpet, a uh, trombone. 
And after the first couple of bars, it was like, oh, wow, maybe Rico was right. And it was amazing. <laughs> it's like, I mean, we had a massive spliff, so that might have of helped. Of course, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, maybe Rico, that's what, that's what he was trying to tell me. Wow. Right. Well, you know, one thing I learned from Rico, though, he's profoundly disciplined, always yeah. practicing. And I that's think he got that from Dan Drummond. You know, Dan yeah. Drummond used to uh, play I'm around the club. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So true. Yeah, he got and the boys he got from his teacher Dan. Yeah, yeah. Practice, he got practice, with practice, the ruler. practice, 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 and no. take yeah, so. Do you know how you get to? Do you know how you get to Carnegie? Do you know how you get huh? to Carnegie Hall? How? Do you know how to get to Carnegie Hall? No. I'm oh. trying to practice, think. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> <laughs> um. Daniel, so um, UB40 was a big gateway for me to to Jamaican music, and and you and you, um, I really enjoyed the part of your book too, where you touch on UB40. Well, will, will you touch on um, their relationship to Two Tone and what could have been, or? or... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it starts with Rankin Roger. I mean, in middle of nineteen seventy nine, he used to jump on stage with UB40, do his sixteen bars of of rap and then go over to a beat gig and do exactly the same. And so he had a choice, which it is before Astro was in UB40. Oh. So he had a choice which band to choose. And um, on the two-tone bus that I mentioned earlier, the first two-tone tour, they had a cassette um, of the beat and a cassette of um, UB40 that they played on the coach. Wow. And it was up to the members of the band to who, who, whichever band got the biggest cheer, got the deal with Two Tone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other part of that is that Jerry told me that actually, he, <coughs> excuse me, he was uncertain about UB40 because of the song King. He said that the lyric, uh, King, where are your people now? Chained and pacified. Um, you led them, what's the next couplet? Uh, mm. Uh, and now whatever that lot he okay. said yeah. he said that the if you if the, the complete verse jerry thought that the um uh, that you'd be 40 were perhaps suggesting that um that the policies of martin luther king hadn't been successful and he felt slightly uncomfortable with it plus the fact that they had a more laconic beat which wasn't quite two-tone at that point so he 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 happily went with the beat instead of ub40 right Interesting. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion and from the research you've done, what were the most significant events for Two Town, i.e. Uh, television movement, recording, tour, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, I think getting gangsters onto television, getting into the top 10, getting it onto the radio, yes. those three things, uh, brought two-tone and the specials to the public attention mm -hmm. i think that was really really important because you know if you're on top of the pops uh, you could be seen by 20 million people that was a third mm -hmm. of the uk population at that point wow. Um, wow. That if, you're, if you're on radio one you could be 10 12 million people could be listening to you it was right. the only pop station to listen to so it broke the specials. And as a result, because of Jerry's policy of I've got a label and I'm going to bring other bands in, Gangsters becoming a hit sure. was, was essential. If it hadn't, <clears throat> and it become like, if it gone in at number 43 in the charts, Two Tone would have been something entirely different. So I think that was hugely significant. I think the, the, the decision to follow up gangsters uh sorry ghost town the special second number one the most important record that specials probably ever released in terms of reflecting society at the exact moment it was at which was racism police racism disenfranchised youth um it was all wrapped up in that record they then mm -hmm. released the boiler <clears throat> and the oh, as, yeah. Right there. Yeah, I see that. Yes. Uh, I, I had to choose a record to display at a recent two-tone exhibition as the most important two-tone record. That was my choice. So I got sent it back. 
at the end. I think it's the most one of the most important records in rock and roll history, never mind uh, two tone, because it's a spoken word piece about male violence and it ends in a rape. And to and to dramatize the rape, Rhoda Dacker, the singer, screamed for one minute. So you struggle to listen to that record twice. The record then charted in the UK at number 35, which is astonishing. Um, so that's that would be my second. And yeah. then I think thirdly, I would point to Nelson Mandela because I'm sure tens and tens of thousands of people like myself had never heard of Nelson Mandela um, before the release of that record. N more so the African National Congress, uh, who our prime minister of the day, Margaret Thatcher, had spoken mm -hmm. in Parliament and said that it was a terrorist organisation. Um, <clears throat> so that record taught me something that I didn't learn in school. The boiler taught me about rape. You don't learn that about in school. And gangsters taught me about black and white unity. And you don't right. learn that in school. Two term was my education. Right, <laughs> in a great education. Yeah, right. definitely. Yeah. yeah that's that's, uh, for me, um, as you mentioned, Free Nelson Mandela was that was really actually a landmark content because I was very I was living in New York and I was very active in the anti-apartheid movement. So when that song came out, I decided, well, I couldn't dismiss two-tone music as just noise, 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 and a distortion of reggae in the more. So Free Nelson Mandela was uh my gateway, uh, or should I say the record that really opened my eyes and I decided I have to accept our two tone. <laughs> wow. And really, I mean, I think t t Jerry took a little bit there from Soul Limbo by Booker T and the MGs. Oh, it's yes, I can see that. More a soul song, isn't it? Sure, sure. sure. Great point. And, uh, and, uh, and maybe James Taylor Quartet, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great band. Did, they, did, uh, did James Taylor Quartet do the music for Starsky and Hutch? Uh... I, I, I was a big fan. Of yeah, no, I was a big fan of that series, but I can't remember who did that. But I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't think it was them. But no, no, I'm getting that confused. No, they, they did some big uh, TV program. Yeah, yeah, great oh. band, great band, Hammond organ, B3. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Junior. So, uh, through your conversation and your interviews with legend Jamaican singers or groups who played a role in what, or uh, actually who played a role in shaping. Uh, popularizing two-tone. We could start with Prince Buster, one of the most, I uh, guess, well-established. Uh, Derek Morgan, Pioneer, Desmond Decker and the Aces. Anybody else? Yeah, well, what have you heard through your conversation? Okay. Obviously, we touched. you touched on, Daniel, the the meeting for the first time, right, of, of Jackie Robinson of the Pioneers with Rhoda, which is incredible when 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 idols meet their idols, right? Um, but through your conversations, as, as Junior asked, what other legendary Jamaican artists are, 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 are name checked often. Well, Prince Buster's is huge because, you know, uh, the Mad Madness's first single is, is, is dedicated wholly mm. to Prince Buster. And their I name mean, and their name itself too, Madness. Exactly. And then that's the B side of their two tone single. And then the A side, Lee Thompson, the sax player, basically had Prince Buster's fabulous greatest hits brought together about three or four different ideas lyrically and a couple of uh, sax ideas and put them all into one. And that's, and that's, that's as a, a tribute as, as possibly could be. And then on the next record, One Step Beyond, Chaz Smash took an idea. I think it's from Scorcher, isn't it? The Prince Buster, where he says, you know, the don't, don't watch this, watch mm, yes, the, the Scorcher. I think it's from that, isn't it? And then Chaz Smash just developed that pattern right. for One Step Beyond, and then One Step Beyond's a Prince Buster song. So Prince Buster's looms so large, and then on the specials, Ooh. first album, there's Prince, Prince Buster tracks, Too Hot, Enjoy Yourself, you know, yeah. um, Judge Dredd idea, you know, yeah. Rude Boy Sentenced to Jail, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, he's everywhere, really. Um, you can't, you, you know, he was such an important figure. And then again, uh, you know, for us kids in England or who didn't know about this kind of music. Um, and when I bought Fabulous when I was a schoolboy because I'd, I'd heard it mentioned and then you kind of hear all these originals and oh, right. you, know, like you hear Al Capone, which is, right. you hear, oh, wow, that's where gangsters takes ideas from and, you know, opened up a whole world. And I was, too, I was talking to Junior about this at Supernova and like the intensified um, compilations I got that as a school kid because I wanted to find out 
what what the original of Carrigo Brincom was, for example, you know, things like that. And then you suddenly learn about the scatellites and all these offshoots sure. of that. Sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. Well, what, what Buster is in a class by himself. He was really and truly a rebel. Who's the sense of the word? Buster. Right. Prince Buster. You yeah, said? Prince Buster. Yeah, Prince Buster. He was definitely a rebel. Uh, you know, uh, people really and truly love him as uh, in Jamaica as much as they love him abroad. Because he really uh, mm -hmm. uh, spoke up for the poor, the oppressed, the less fortunate. Right. And, and multi-talented right, producer, record man, and, and obviously singer. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, he, needed to, he needed to address his views on uh, women a little bit, as as did many uh, of those Jamaican records. You know? Sure. sure <laughs> right. of those. Some, yeah, some early slack. Right. Um, yeah, Ten Commandments, you know, that uh, that isn't, you know, okay. good. Right. True, and we can think of a few others. So, uh, and, and talk about the pioneers at this show, uh, the pioneers last October when Lenville Golden was in town. Lenville got on stage and said, "If it wasn't for pioneers, there would be no specials." Um, so to hear Lenville say that, right? And he obviously said that in front of the pioneers to the crowd, which was amazing to hear. Um, and then I, I also loved in the I don't know if it was late eighties, early nineties. When when a version of the special was recorded with Desmond Decker, uh, that was uh, you know the one album that they did. I think it was um, yeah, King of Kings is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the production wasn't necessarily my, my my taste. It was a little too overproduced. But but nonetheless, the combination there and bridge uh, the generations were great. I can't be doing with things like that. That wasn't the specials. I mean, Terry Hall wasn't on it, and Jerry Damage wasn't on it. You know, I know. It's like, it's like the Reform Fun Boy specials. You know, it's. Sure. It's using the name for one for a very obvious reason, right? Uh, right. But it's sure. not. No, it's, it's not what we know as two tone specials. Of course not. One hundred percent not. Yeah, yeah. Great, great point. Um, so the fact that um, Prince Buster lived in England and uh, also who else lived in England? The pioneers. Do you think that helped the movement? Any the two tone movement? Have no, those guys? I think two tone helped those. Those musicians, I think that the gratitude was held was there. Yeah, those bands being influenced by the by the Jamaican music and Caribbean music and covering it. But I think at that point, many of those musicians were not really playing very big uh, gigs or were not really selling very many records. And right. and, and I think Two Tone brought them back into the limelight in the same way as UB40's Labour of Love record highlighted a whole mm -hmm. stack of songs and musicians that have been again overlooked and the same way right. which, the same way in which the beatles when they first came to the states played lots of obscure motown songs and yes. like, wow right. this music's incredible and then the beatles are like but it's your music <laughs> <laughs> right true Such yes yes so um mm -hmm. So Daniel, as we as we near the the end of our conversation, so I want to touch on another book of yours um, uh, that I read uh, like maybe last summer, um, and that was your book on Rankin Roger. Oh right, okay. I, I just can't stop at my life in the beat. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed that. I, I was I was I would say the first two tone type of band in that second wave of ska that I was into was the English Beat. They obviously played a huge role and. Uh, and popularity here in the U.S. and general public as well. But but during um, through your conversations and research, what surprised you the most? There we go. Yes, yes, yes. I, I couldn't find it. I might have lent it out to a friend, or else I'd have it as a visual here too. But what surprised you the most <laughs> um, about the conversations, either or the research uh, about Rankin Roger? Um, maybe not surprised what fascinated no you? no 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 okay. well Roger wanted to be as honest to himself as he possibly could be I noticed that and yeah. as a result he probably told stories that uh you know I mean I I think he he probably hurt Dave Wakeling with some of his stories mm -hmm. and and I questioned Roger about it and he said, I need to tell the truth the way I saw it. I'm only telling the truth the way I saw it. Um, and that was Roger's choice. And just in the weeks before he died, his sister read the whole manuscript to Roger. And even she 
She said, Roger, are you sure you want to say some of these things? And he said, no, this is exactly, this is my last testament. and I'm really proud of it. And he phoned me up and told me all that and said he was pleased at what he'd done. Yeah. And um, so I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting such rawness in his, no. in his honesty. But right. right. But, but, but the way, from what I remember, the way that it was written or the way that it was told didn't come didn't come across as trying to be hurtful clearly it was it was just to your point being honest right and, yeah. and i kind of take it a little bit i, I read keith richard's life that that, yeah. that book. brilliant brilliant book brilliant book yes a very thick book but, but brilliant book and, and talk about a life but but there were similar not similar but but the way that that keith kind of was honest about mick right and kind of that I, there were some i don't want to say similarities but 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 it was i kind of liken it to that a little bit um, yeah, and I, I think a lot of books often, to my mind, is about when you consider the narrative as a whole, and then you say, okay, how has this person come out of the narrative? Right. And of and certainly, if there's negativity, is there anything to balance it? And I think in what Roger was doing, and my with my try influence behind it, was to try and say, you know your love for this person is there the negative <clears throat> negativity is down here so that's a good balance i guess mm -hmm. and uh and i think roger was conscious of that because on the whole when there was an uncomfortable moments in his story or people uh, acts or things that he did and other people did that he wasn't happy with there were other moments where he shows his love and gratitude to those people yeah yeah uh, that, 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 that's great yeah and i agree with that and, and i would definitely encourage fans also a, a nice companion book to to your too much too young would be the, the rank and roger one and he chose this cover you know roger well wow. i didn't i didn't like it i i had a, I, 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 I had another picture where he's a, um he's got a dance set on the floor and he's kind of coming out the picture like that oh, okay a, yeah well so remind me the, the when did the book come out and when did he pass it was actually published like within a month or so after he after he died. Wow! Oh, and then, uh, it's just so all the plans yeah. that we had, of course, right? And all the events that I could be doing with Roger, yeah, I didn't do. I mean, I have done events with Roger in the past because sure. of my book about Rock Against Racism, right? And uh, and it was brilliant because I went up to his house in Birmingham from London on three separate occasions, and I'd spend three solid days with him on each of those three occasions so nine days and uh i'd arrive and he'd roll up a massive spliff <laughs> and uh and then we'd just talk all day long in um and uh and as we talked he had a big um screen above his mixing desk where he recorded and he just kept on dialing up footage of the beat to whatever i mentioned as to try and trigger his memory he'd be watching the footage so if it was the us festival oh, amazing 82 or 83 yeah. he would watch it back and and then he would, so that would give him the memory to talk about it or if it was a, a performance on this television show or this sure. and you go you know sure. why i'm behaving like this or you know that so so you get a real fresh yeah. he wasn't trying to desperately go what was that or what was this or well, that's but that's smart yeah that's, yeah, that's, and then he played me records like "Smoking My Ganja," uh, that that influential uh, by Capital Letters. And he, I remember he went in, he got a pod in his garden, which it doubled up as a, another recording studio. Right. And he, and and he said, "You've got to listen to the twelve inch really loud." So we went in there and he just played it, slammed down the <laughs> needle. And we listened to it at full volume, and he was dancing around, loving it. I really, Roger was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I had a chance to. Um... I had a chance to see the general public perform uh, and then I had a chance when Roger did a solo tour up at Reagan the River, Northern California in the late 90s. Uh, he yeah. had a band and I got a chance to, to sit down and talk with him there and snap one good photo. But um, yeah, such an amazing talent for sure. Um, uh, well, Junior, I have one, one more question that wasn't scripted here, but but um, Daniel, and I know that you only were at the Sunday of Supernova because you had you had already uh planned different speaking uh, or book uh, uh engagements throughout the east coast but um to get a chance to meet other authors uh, we talked about heather obviously pauline uh but like mark wasserman who's a friend of ours and 
and and there were a number of authors there and 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 Tim and April did a great job of doing the sky education right so they had three days of different authors uh, no Eric organized that that wasn't them too oh sorry who did uh, Eric okay nice okay yeah, those so, just, just gave the okay they didn't have anything okay to do. okay well I mean it was brilliant um so there are a number of books that have come out post maybe uh, some pre COVID but most post COVID right. Uh, on on ska and two tone and, and American ska, what have you? Um, why why do you think there's been such an influx of of some you know amazing books uh, at this point in time? Well, in the UK, there hasn't been. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I was writing primarily to talk about a UK scene. Yes. Um, not not knowing what would happen to the book in the US. Okay. In the UK, George Marshall wrote a book about Two Tone in about 1991, really slim um, edition. This, oh, it's here. Um, it's really, I mean, it's great. Oh, right, I've seen that, okay, yeah. Yeah, really great, but it's really thin. Um, and I, I, and apart from that, there hasn't been a book on Two Tone record label. Um, nice. And so, so I felt that that's why I wanted to do it. Sure. And then yeah. in the US, I mean, I can't speak for that because my book is about two term records. Sure, ends sure. Yeah. Six. I don't really have a full grasp of of American scar and the scenes that you had on the on the on the dual coasts. Right. So why that's happening in, in, in your country, I don't know. Here, yeah. um, uh, I don't know if it was particularly a poignant timing. It just what but what has happened since the publication of Too Much Too Young? is that it's tapped into a, a nerve for sure, because I think it's becoming my most successful book. Wow, and, congratulations. And, uh, and just wherever, thank you. And wherever, you know, we do two-tone events, you know, it's been over almost a year since publication in the UK, and I've still got events booked through to the end of to Christmas, and you're lucky oh. if you get three months of events on, on uh, when you... Wow. Publishing. So, so it's tough. It's right. tapped into something, you know. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah. Having said that, I wanted to ask you, um, for uh, someone who wants to become a writer, you become such an established, iconic, and legendary writer. What kind yeah. of words are for uh, 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 people who want to become a writer? You know, Gina. You know, you know when yeah. I, I when I wrote my first book, I was I was a musician, as you kindly said at the beginning of the program. But I, 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 need, I wanted to write a book. And so I just started writing it. And I just told everybody I met, I'm, I'm going to become an author. And, and the people were laughing because I was really thick at school. And, and I just thought I've got, a, I've got an idea for a book that if it was on the shelves, mm. I, would, I would want to go and buy it because I want to read it. Mm. And that's always what I've, I've done. Uh, if I've, I think about my idea and think, would I want to read that book? And and then right. I just write it before I've even got the deal. Wow. And if the deal happens before I finish, brilliant. And um, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. But I have conviction in the idea that somebody will do yeah. it. So right. I, my simple advice is, if you have, if you want to be a writer, just be a writer and write. Yes. Oh. Like if you want to be a musician, you can't. You don't. You don't phone up Sting or Brian Ferry for permission. You just get a guitar or you piano and write a song. Yeah, just do it and form a band. Just do it. True. Yes, and, and discipline. Discipline. Learn yeah. from Rico, who learned yeah. from that. <laughs> yeah, Don Drummond knew that much, didn't he? Get, right. Yes, get right. around right. the right. right. Carnegie. <laughs> yeah. So, so Daniel, where, where can where can people pick up your book? Everywhere. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. You you kids have got the devices. Find it. You know? If it's not a record shop, yes. complain. If it's not in a bookshop, complain. There it's... we go. Request it. <laughs> yes. And then, and then you can get it online. But uh, but right. Akashic Akashic published it, and they're great. So you know. So mm. um, hopefully they're doing their job. Yeah. Right. So uh, any parting words? Uh, we just arrived to our destination. From you, the Daniel. train has arrived in Scarfield. <laughs> <laughs>
Is there anything that we need to cover that you'd like to talk about? <laughs> Sorry? Is there anything that uh, we didn't touch on that you'd like to bring forth? No, you've touched everything I like. I, I wanted you to. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Daniel, right. it, it was it was really... Was English, English. Carry on smutter humor, sorry. <laughs> uh, it was yes, really, sir. It was really a... Gladiator tour was a success. Yeah. So you're yeah. planning to go to places like, I guess, uh, why Australia came to mind? I well, don't know, Australia, New Zealand. I've just been invited to Rome. Ooh, no. Oh, Ma Malta, oh. Man. Nice. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Me chiamo Daniela, too much too young. Take it, take it around the world. Take it around the world. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Daniel, well, thank I you. Think, yeah. I think we have to put this Thank top you. around. That's about does it, right? Thanks to uh everyone. Yes. Uh, for the ongoing support. Uh please subscribe to this uh, podcast series and to our YouTube channel. Follow us on History of Eleskia on Instagram and join our Facebook group, which is growing leaps and bounds. This series uh, is produced by Rockwell Radio, Eric Cole. Junior, thank Please you. your part in celebrating and preserving this great music. And I, yet I said that, Eric, uh, I said that repeatedly at Supernova because I really and truly want people to support the festival. Not because they hired me, but because I do see the need and the necessity for Scare to remain. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I, I, I second that. Support, and then... support. support. Right. Daniel, congrats on everything. Uh, really enjoyed spending time with you in Los Angeles, uh, reading your books. Um, and we're actually going to be talking with Sarah Jane coming up here as well. Uh, oh, brilliant. To thank you for that introduction. Um, and yeah, continued success for you. Um, and definitely appreciate all the support out there uh, in uh, podcast land and um, please do your part to celebrate and preserve the scene super important as junior mentioned and i'll leave you with this uh, come on out put on your dancing shoes and enjoy yourself until next time daniel junior yeah, good luck, daniel yes Keep take good work yeah thank you very much for having me it was and get great yes, what's your next book next book the your next book, the your next book. Times what you working on the life and times of Junior Francis. <laughs> I'll, give no, you, your I'll, career. I'll give you. I'll give you some. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an exclusive interview. I I have some some behind the scenes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't second that, man. You ruin your career. And we can't afford it. <laughs> your reputation. <laughs> uh, much love and respect. Take care. Yeah. Good to you guys. All, the best. All right. Take care now. Bye bye now.